Okay, okay, so there are many questions and suggestions regarding this whole topic, and I'm going to try and get through all of them. Welcome back to Striking FPV R&D. My name's Ashton, and I honestly don't know where this whole toroidal prop thing is going, but I maybe have some answers. Now, before I get into it, I'd like to first of all thank everybody once again for your interest in the subject and just, you know, I'm now at 2,600 plus subscribers at this point. I've had like 50 to 60,000 combined views on the last two videos and 300 plus comments on the videos as well as the posts regarding the new designs. It's a lot of very interesting discussion and uh, it just kind of goes to show the kind of community that we've managed to build here in the FPV space. And FYI, my latest V3 tri-loop and my V2 bi-loops were already uploaded to printables and thingiverse, so the former is available from two to five inches. The latter is currently, I think just five, but I'm gonna try and make it four and seven before I upload this, so have a look. So if you wanna download those and skip watching this video and just start printing, then go for it. But I may have some interesting answers for you regarding materials and stuff like that. So, you know, maybe stick around. If not, there's always chapters down below. I always put chapters so you can click ahead to see what you might be interested in. Now, FYI, there's a lot of stuff to cover. So I've written some stuff on the computer to remind me. So. I might be looking back and forth, hope you don't mind. Now, the first big question is why? Why are we doing this? Why are we interested in the toroidal topic to begin with? Well, the basic premise and promise of the recent MIT paper is that there's potential for these props to be both quieter and more efficient. Now, after the past week or so of craziness, I'm starting to think that actually those base claims might not be that achievable, at least in 3D printing. Toroidals being quieter is actually a bit misleading. Uh, the truth is that their sound profile is supposedly different, being whooshier and bassy, as opposed to standard props, which kind of scream more, they have a bit more treble, they're a little bit more annoying, more attention-seeking, so to speak. Most of the testers noticed that they were more whooshy, and to some degree, some people noted that as it flew further away, they became quieter, faster than standard props did, but that's just anecdotal evidence. Now, efficiency-wise, I'm also starting to doubt, because with the greater weight and the surface area that toroidals have. So if you consider a standard bi-blade, there is two blades. But if you consider the standard bi-loop toroidal design, there's actually four blades at play there. So it's closer to a quad blade regular prop than it is to a bi-blade regular prop in that it's heavier and has more surface area and more drag on the air. So I think that alone is gonna cause issues with efficiency. Now, if efficiency is what you're after, then the bi-loop design is probably the most interesting to you. Or even, if you've ever seen those single-bladed regular props, then maybe a single loop toroidal could be the way to do it. So I'm talking like one side is the blade structure of the loop, and then the other side is a counterweight. I'm not gonna be doing that, but maybe later on in this video, some of you will have the tools with which to do that yourself if you think that's kind of a crazy idea. So good luck to you. Number two. If not quietness and efficiency, then what's the real reason why we're doing this? I think it comes down to three basic things. Curiosity, community, and for the lulls. Because, you know, let's face it, watching ourselves 3D printing a part that the vast majority of us agree probably shouldn't be 3D printed, that's kind of amusing. But those of us trying it out are genuinely curious to know what they're like, how they might fly, and I think most of us are really enjoying the discussion regarding all of it. Many people are offering ideas and suggestions for improvements of the designs all in an effort to maybe create the next best thing since sliced bread, right? And like I mentioned in my previous video, I feel like the tri-loop design is also less destructive because it's more round, it's less likely to slice you open, so there's that benefit. But in this time, reading all of your comments and suggestions, I think I found two much more likely reasons for doing this. Number one, they look cool. And number two, we can print them in the sense that these are actually quite viable 3D printed props. Now hear me out. 3D printed props are usually not a good idea, right? Usually FDM printing where you squeeze out stuff in the shape that you want, it's much weaker than injection molded stuff, right? So as a result, a 3D printed prop is not usually the done thing. You normally have to thicken them up to give them strength. That's the thing about the tri-loop design though, because instead of having, let's say, we'll go with this prop, as you go further out on the blade, there's more force involved. And so in order to maintain the rigidity and not have the thing splinter apart, as FDM often does, you need to make it thicker. But the tri-loop design that we came up with 
That is interesting because the blade actually goes back into itself a little bit further out of the hub, kind of, you know, midway out. So it intrinsically has a bit more rigidity without having to sacrifice, say, adding more thickness to the blade. So that's a little bit of benefit to the tri-loop design. Now, considering that there is a subset of the FPV community who, you know, focus on 3D printing drones, so they're printing the frame, they're printing all the accessories, and some of them are also printing props, we might have just actually, you know, completed another part of their puzzle by creating the tri-loop 3D printable prop which is actually more viable than a standard design prop in terms of its strength. Or at least that's kind of what I think. Maybe, maybe that's completely false, but you know, we'll find out in the next, I don't know, month as this becomes more, uh, more the done thing. Who knows? So number three, what's the best shape? Why don't you flatten the tip? Why don't you loop it like a box wing? Why not go full shallow boat prop? Why not do it like a screw? Why don't you lift the trailing blade so it's higher and catches more of the airstream? I've had so many suggestions and questions, many excellent, I will add. And a lot of what I've just said, as much as it's sort of, you know, a bit overwhelming, it is very legitimate, very good questions. And it's that kind of curiosity that carries us forward. But I'll first start off with basically the main premise of the Toroidal prop as outlined by the MIT folks and the, the Lincoln lab. Basically, Wingtips cause turbulence, right? And turbulence is no bueno. Rotors or propellers are basically spinning wings with tips, so much turbulence, such loss, very inefficiency. Boo. But here's the thing. If there is no tip, no turbulence, or less turbulence, you know, that's a good thing. So if we could make a blade that loops back as if it doesn't really have a tip, well, much clever, such think. Very efficiency. Wow. Or at least that's what it would be like if it were easier to design. You see, as I've discovered, it's not actually that easy. My first iteration was basically the obvious way, which was two sets of circles that were rotationally offset from one another, lofting between the two to create the sort of blade angle, and then print it out. But that's not really efficient. In fact, Quad Mover did do this for his video, and it was huge toroidal surface area, huge, such that the hub was actually covering the motors themselves. So very much a kind of brute force way of doing things, right? Now this method isn't actually very good because there's no airfoil. You see, most of these blades have an airfoil shape, but the lofting method doesn't really adhere to that. It's just straight lines between the two profiles. So my second design did actually incorporate a rough airfoil shape. It doesn't it's not like a NACA design or a CT-001 or whatever the various airfoil designs happen to be, but it was roughly an airfoil shape. And I think that did improve things. I definitely got the shape from the hub and then out midway towards the edge. But then the problem comes when you need to create the loop because as you go out towards the looping point, the blade actually has to become more vertical before it can invert and then become the opposite direction, right? This means that the angle of attack is increasing further out, which is actually opposite to what you want. And I'll explain why. You see, props are measured in diameter and pitch and number of blades, usually in inches. So a four by three by two prop, it's basically four inches diameter, three inch pitch, and then two blades. Now the pitch measurement is interesting because we don't measure angles in inches, obviously. So the way pitch actually works is in a theoretical sense, how far forward will the prop actually travel if it were to rotate one full revolution? That's what the pitch is. So basically, in the case of a three inch pitch prop, if it rotates one revolution, it should travel forward by about three inches. That's what the pitch is. The reason why we measure pitch like this instead of defining the angle of attack is because the angle of attack has to change at different points along the blade. Basically has to become shallower further out. And the way I can explain this is using Vision 360. So here's a little demo scene that I set up. And basically here we have three coils or three helixes. These were created using the coil command here. So if we go in to have a look at this, basically the helix or the coil, because it's the coil feature, is basically setting the diameter 12 to 12 millimeters, setting the revolution to one, one revolution, and then the height is 25.4 millimeters, which is one inch, multiplied by three, so it's three inches in height. 
and there we have this particular helix. But now if we have a look at the other ones, these other helixes, helixes, is there a plural for this? These other helixes are using the exact same height, the same number of revolutions, but using a different diameter. In this case, we have a mid section helix, and then we also have the outer section. And as you notice, if we go to the right profile view, the angle that the helix has to travel in order to get to the top is different. Now, if we then develop our airfoils following this pattern, so we have a very steep airfoil near the hub, we then add a more medium kind of airfoil for the midsection, and then we add an even shallower airfoil for the outer section, this will actually give us a rough airfoil shape. And all we need to do is loft between them to get our final airfoil shape. So if I now hide the helix, helixes like this, we now get something which looks somewhat like a gem fan. Not exactly, but you get the idea. And now if we look at the profile of the blade, indeed, the blade is starting steep at the hub, it's becoming shallower at the midsection, and it's becoming even more shallow at the edge. And that is basically how prop pitch works. Now I'm very happy to say that actually this is what I've put great effort into for the latest design, because Whilst the previous designs used to have quite a tall edge kind of profile over here, I've shortened it. And the benefit of doing this, not only does it reduce weight at the edge, which should help improve prop response, but the other reason for doing it is that it helps to keep that blade angle just under here, if you can see the mouse, it he helps to keep the blade angle getting shallower and shallower and shallower until the last moment where it has to become upright. Nothing we can really do about that before transitioning to the forward edge where the exact same thing applies, where the angle becomes as shallow as it can the further out you go, but eventually becomes completely vertical. Now, I'm very pleased to say that this design is actually kind of performing as expected. Uh, Johnny from Will It Mod was very quick. He's super quick to print these out and get them tested. And his latest flight, he noted that the props felt a lot more like traditional props. They weren't as weird. They didn't suffer from the strange behaviors as much as the previous generation. So I'm, I think I can say that the current design generation is more or less a success. So that's kind of where we're at. Now the interesting questions. What about flattening the edge? Well, I mean, if we flattened the edge to become, you know, as thin as like a traditional prop, then we've kind of reintroduced the idea of a blade tip. And the whole purpose of toroidals is to not have a blade tip. So I'm not going to flatten out the tip because I don't think it will help. But if somebody else wants to give it a go, more than welcome to, I'm not stopping you. A couple of people suggested uh, a loop style. Basically, there's like some old airplane designs where instead of having wings and then they just have tips like that, they basically made the wing go out and then over itself. So kind of a biplane, but a single loop. Now, we could do that, but the issue with that is, let's say if we keep the same hub height, then that blade would have to come up, loop over, and then rejoin the hub. And just the fact that it has to come up means that we're now going to be printing in midair, which is kind of difficult. Uh, if you wanted to, say, do like a double-decker kind of blade thing, then we would need a taller hub, but most of our motors don't have tall enough shafts to support that, unless you did the quad mover thing and make the entire motor the hub, in which case you can maybe try it out. But you can see that that sort of thing, this ribbon loop idea, kind of impractical and definitely increasing, increasing weight in a big way, and that'll slow down response, so not entirely sure that's the way to go, but you know, who knows. Regarding lifting the trailing blade, so in the bi-loop design, basically a single loop has the leading blade and the trailing blade. Because they're so close together, some people suggested, why don't we make the trailing blade maybe a bit steeper or just lift it a bit higher so it's more in the airstream? I kind of thought about that as well very early on and it's tempting, but if you notice, this is a five blade gem fan. I think this is a D90 or something, uh, it's a 3.5 inch, but basically all the blades are getting closer to one another, but of course there's no blade that's higher than the next one. In fact, no fan design does this. So I don't think it makes sense to add this with the by loop. Um, also, I kind of worry because in that pairing of the leading and the trailing blade that makes up the, the loop, if you were to add extra surface area or extra, you know, angle of attack on the rear one, 
that would end up creating more drag and or more lift on the rear. And that might end up twisting the pairing together and actually change the angle of attack. And I have a feeling that that will result in maybe strange oscillations or whatever the case, it's very unpredictable behavior. So I, I don't think that's a good idea at this point, but you know, if you want to give it a go, more than welcome to. Then there's the Sharrow prop, then there's the Lily Impeller, and everything else on the Fan Showdown, which I do like, the Fan Showdown is a cool show. So I'll leave this long answer to question three with what I plan to do with my designs. One, it has to print relatively easily, so that's everything starting on the print bed and, you know, nothing floating. Two, minimal post-processing. So if we can avoid supports, great. If we need a little bit of them, then fine, but we don't want to do too much in the way of having to remove bits off the bed or things like that, too much sanding. Um, number three, probably the most interesting one, empower others to create their own designs. So let me expand on that with question number four, can I have a step file? Now I've had numerous people ask me this, including some university students that kind of want to do, you know, a thesis kind of thing, studying different designs, which is very cool. Traditionally, the answer to that question was no, because my early designs, the first toroidal was actually a terrible design. The second toroidal, much more interesting, but the layout of the file is still kind of a bit of a mess and not very parametric, so I, I didn't want to do that. But right now, I feel like I'm in a place where I can release them because my, my third generation tri-loop, my second generation bi-loop, the file design, the structure, all the steps that are required to make it I feel like makes a lot more sense. It's a lot cleaner, it's a lot more understandable. Now there are a number of ways to tackle this design and there are far more talented people than, than me in terms of CAD software who suggested maybe you should use surface modeling that makes more sense. I completely agree because I've seen more people do propeller designs with surface modeling than solid body modeling, but it's the way I've managed to get it to work and I seem to be able to work with it relatively well. So. I'm happy to share, with, share it at this point. In fact, if you go to my latest designs on Printables or Thingiverse, you will actually find that I've already uploaded the step files on both the sites. So if you want to download them and try to edit them in Fusion 360, should work. I'm not sure about other CAD programs, but you know, if they all work roughly the same, then fingers crossed, it'll work out for you. And for those of you who are afraid of trying Fusion 360, it is free for non-commercial use. So no excuses, you should go and download it and just have a play around, at least to, to see what us CAD people are messing around with. Also related, I lead into fact number five. Will you release a tutorial teaching us how to make these designs? And the answer is yes. I do have plans to do so, but like I said earlier, my earlier designs were kind of a mess and so I didn't really want to base any tutorial on those but now I'm at a point where the designs are cleaner and so I feel like I can reliably teach it with as minimal head banging on my part and probably on your part as well so you know stay tuned for that. Number six what materials should we use? Well if you're FDM printing like most of us, me certainly, uh, I've heard good reports from PETG uh, Silk PLA also seems to be really good, worked for Johnny, and uh, others seem to be quite content with ASA. Polycarbonate, you know, most props, I think this is made out of polycarbonate, but this is injection molded, so I'm not 100% sure how polycarbonate fares in the extruded sort of FDM world, so 50-50. If you've printed with polycarbonate before, if you've printed props with polycarbonate, do let us know in the comments what you think, because I still don't know. Um, strangely, some people didn't have great experience with nylon. There were a couple people who printed with nylon and they were fine, but others were saying that the overhangs were weird. And of course, nylon has that thing with moisture in the air, as well as they warp a little bit like ABS does if you don't have a heated chamber. So nylon kind of 50-50 at the moment. Here's the thing. I once suggested TPU for the tri-loops because of, you know, safety, flexibility, but a number of people have tried that out and it's way too flexible. It kind of, it just twists and collapses in on itself as the motor spins up. So ignore past me. It's a bad idea. Don't do TPU. It's, it's not worth it. Uh, one other thing I will mention for 3D printing, especially FDM, the infill might make a difference. I logically think concentric infill makes sense because it keeps everything in a kind of circle. Uh, but I think a lot of people have been doing rectilinear infill and that seemed to be doing okay. But personally, I think concentric makes the most sense, but you know, you do you, whatever works best. Now, 
materials in the resin world. I'm not an expert. I know very little about resin printing, so I had one person suggest a filament, not filament, a resin called Tenacious, which sounds kind of fun. And a couple of other people have been saying that mixing hard resins with flexible resins in varying amounts seems to yield pretty decent results. So that's a kind of cool little science experiment you guys can do. Uh, you certainly have more knowledge than, than I do. So listen to yourselves, follow your heart, as they say. Now I will make a bonus mention of the cupping blowout issue. For those of us in the FDM world, we have no idea what this is, but if you've dabbled in resin printing, you might be aware. Cupping blowout is an interesting uh, issue that happens. Basically, if you have a concave shape that's you know facing down into the vat of the resin, then as the resin, as the piece rises out of the resin, the resin, being a liquid, is kind of sucking on that cup shape, hence cupping blowout. So what's the blowout? Well, if the wall is thin enough, then the wall will collapse and you will suffer a blowout. That was a small amount, just ran across my floor. Anyway, so cupping blowout. I'm aware of this issue. And uh, for now, if you don't mind, place your own little drain holes to kind of relieve the stresses if you can. But I am planning to do a run of SLA friendly blades that are going to have thinner bases and tiny little drain holes for the hub section and especially for the blades which hopefully will make the, the printing process for resin better but you know if you have more input on how to solve the issue then please leave them down in the comments below like the kind commenters from my last video who brought this to my attention number seven blade or loop like how do we refer to them well i do believe loop makes the most sense here because if we say a bi blade toroidal Actually, the bi blade is actually a quad blade because there's two blades per loop, right? So a bi blade is really a quad blade. And the same thing goes for the tri blade is actually a hex blade. So do we say like a quad blade toroidal or do we say a bi blade toroidal? Or it's too confusing. But if you say loop, so bi loop, well, we know there's two loops. Tri loop, we know there's three loops. I think that does make the most sense. So there we go. Now, for branding, I think someone suggested that these props basically look like spinning scimitars. So, scimitar prop, kind of a cool name. I came up with maybe like scythe blades, that's a potential. Someone recently said propel loops, or maybe toroidal loops. Sounds like breakfast cereal, but anyway. Now, number eight, I read somewhere that these can't be injection molded. Is that true? Basically, according to the general rules of injection molding, yeah, um, it's not really doable. Basically, the complex shape of the toroidal prop means that you could machine a mold to inject into, but then the part, once it's solidified, won't be able to pop out of the mold. We don't think. I mean, polycarbonate's flexible enough that maybe you might be able to twist it out there, but like, I just, it's, it's not looking good. And the MIT guys also mentioned that 3D printing is kind of the only the only option here. So yeah, mass production would have to be 3D printed, more or less, uh, maybe using resin, maybe sintering. Uh, you may have noticed that one of the MIT designs actually was a bi-loop that was split in half and kind of secured together by using the two bolts, the two tiny little screws. That might be an option. If we could get halves of a bi-loop injection molded, then maybe things like folding props for DJI drones would be a potential use case but for us you know folding props on fpv eh, questionable some people do it some people don't recommend it so you know there is that and that kind of brings us to number nine again because manufacturing is one thing but what about patents you know what's the elephant in the room here is why has this been patented is this patent valid you know what does it mean for us in the commercial sense will i be able to buy it or will you be able to buy it Will we all be able to buy it? You know, I'm not entirely sure. Um, a lot of you have stepped up and suggested that the idea isn't new because shower prop, but some of the language in the patent maybe suggests that the novel idea here is the tri-loops leading blade intersecting with the trailing blade. Uh, many of you have also noted that the info and the graphs don't really offer much substantial information, or at least the information doesn't seem to be supportive of enough of the claims that they make. And so maybe this whole patent thing is kind of, uh, you know, register the patent first and work out the real, real nitty gritty later. They've, they've grabbed the concept. So if somebody else improves upon it, they still own the license because they have the patent. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, interestingly, a commenter on my last video, Robotics Joe, I think, 
he mentioned that he was part of the MIT Lincoln Lab team responsible for making the props and, in his case, for optimizing the design for 3D printing and then getting it to work on the drone, even flying the drone. So I asked if there was anything that he'd be willing to share with the open source community uh, along the lines of, you know, whole mass, not mass production, but mass testing, mass prototyping, that kind of vibe. And I, he said he would ask, but I dare say there's probably not much he can say right now. So he did mention one thing, though, that he was actually the first to flip or roll a toroidal prop. So sorry, Johnny. Sorry, Vladimir. Y'all weren't the first. But the MIT Lincoln Lab did kind of have a head start on the whole concept. So, you know, don't let that get you down. In the end, the Chinese prop manufacturers, you know, if they do get a working product going on, I don't think the patent is going to really stop them from selling to us. I think the patent would only end up being effective with regards to large scale commercial or enterprise dealings. So we're talking like DJI, Autel, Skydio, any contractor for the US military. So I think in the hobby space, I don't think we're gonna run into issues, but you know, touch wood. And just to go slightly off my original script here, I actually have a recent comment from at this moment, three hours ago from a guy named Rob Sturr saying, it's great to see a project I helped work on from 2016 to 2019 finally go public. It honestly is not a new thing, but we were a lot more comfortable going public after our patent went through in 2019. And here's the interesting thing. I'd like to clarify about MIT designing it. Not everyone that's worked on it is from MIT. It's only because I worked on the project using their campus and their equipment. We had no choice but to credit them for it. And in reality, it's actually a pretty big collaboration between lots of individuals from different universities. So whilst we like to throw around the MIT Toroidal Prop thing, the reality is a lot of people were involved in this project and they all deserve you know, equal credit for contributing to what we are now working on. So round of applause for those guys, thumbs up. All right, number 10. So this is not a single question, it's just, you know, last little bits that, you know, some questions have come up. So no, you should not put a toroidal prop into a duct because a duct is trying to sort of increase efficiency by dealing with the wingtip vortices by getting really close up and, you know, trying to eliminate them and the toroidal prop design is actually trying to do the same thing. So it doesn't really make sense to put a toroidal prop into a duct. So no need to do it. Don't do it. Unless you're just curious and you want to see how it goes, then by all means, go for it. It's all fun. Anyway, uh, yes, I do remember those flying toys as a kid with a ring propeller. I actually had a little toy helicopter launching thing that had basically this with a ring that went all the way around. And some people are saying that, well, if you want a quiet prop, then that's what you should do. Well, here's the thing. We've already got complaints about, oh, you know, the, the prop response is going to be terrible because it's a lot heavier. Well, if you have a ring across the whole thing, how do you think your prop response is going to be then? So no, it's not really a, a viable design unless you're just trying to get it quieter and it does make it quieter, but then you're probably going to lose more performance than the toroidal design at present. Uh, another person said the design is trash for RC planes. Well, I noticed some people tested it on propeller aircraft. And yeah, maybe it is crap for that because this particular, you know, design and idea seems to be more directed towards quads and their kind of thing is that they hover. Maybe this design is not optimized for continuous forward motion through the air. Maybe it's actually more optimized for hovering applications or any application where the thrust is not necessarily in line with the direction of travel. So maybe that's what it is uh, we won't know until more and more people test with uh, test with rc planes so there's that the toroidal prop is just another fad and it's rubbish well maybe but we won't know until we fully test it right um feel free to trash talk it while we enjoy our prop explosions and weird noises a lot of the modern things we accept in the fpv space were once fads and some people used to denounce various things and so it was, you know, the dedication of various individuals who just thought maybe it is the next best thing that eventually has shaped the FPV community, the FPV drone design to where it kind of stands today. So if we don't proceed to just test the living daylights out of this concept, we won't ever really know if it is the next best thing or if it is indeed a fad. But while we're here, you know, we get to enjoy the process. So, you know, talk down if you want, but we're having fun. Now we have people saying that your toroidals fly terribly. Well, you know, 
Try PID tuning and avoid angle mode. When you're one of the earliest tests from uh, Vladimir, he showed that angle mode was just flopping around like this, but then acro mode was perfectly fine. Then we've got other people notice that the motors got super hot with the Toroidal props, so they reduced the D term and that cooled down the motors and also resulted in steadier flying. So I think it's crucial that if you are going to test these props, by all means, just try it on the same tune as your regular props, but be aware that you might have to retune the drone to better work with these. In fact, Johnny's kind of weird issue with the yaw, where you yaw and you lose height, I think that's probably related to basically the motors take longer to spin up than the motors that are slowing down to issue the yaw command. So maybe it's a matter of adjusting the pids on the yaw to help make the rotor spin up faster, or I'm not entirely sure, but it's basically the opposite of yaw jump. So whatever fixes we have in place for yaw jump, maybe reverse them, and then you know we'll we'll get better yaw control with these toroidals. But there you go. Also, you got to get the print right. A lot of people are like, oh, your props are unbalanced. It's like, no, no, the design is balanced, but it's about our printers and how well we can tune them and how well we finish the prop. Some people are being proper and printing them out and then putting them on an axle and then trying to balance them. Some people are just printing them, putting them, putting them on the drone and they fly fine. So, you know, that's kind of your due diligence. Like, don't point at me and be like, your design is unbalanced. Because as far as I'm concerned, my rotational symmetry is pretty decent. The computer did it, so it must be pretty decent. Uh, it would purely be down to how we print it out. And so have a look at your own prints before you decide to fly them, just to be safe. And that's the end of the list. You know, uh, since so many of you have now flown with my toroidal designs, I've actually created a playlist up on the top right. You can click the little card. And that's a playlist of all of the various flights and tests that all of you guys have actually been doing. So thank you very much for that. It's fantastic to see, and I'm, you know, very thankful for your involvement. I apologize if I haven't, you know, commented or replied to you in the past, you know, couple of weeks. It's been quite the influx of views and discussion in the past week or so. so. If I've forgotten your video, you know, in that list, then please, you know, write me a comment, put it down below, I'll, I'll try to add it. And again, sorry to take me so long to pump out these latest prop versions, but like I said, I was traveling, you know, I just got back yesterday riding the motorcycle, it's upwards of 3,000 kilometers is no joke. If you want to see what kind of riding I do sometimes, you can check this video from my non-FPV channel that I haven't touched in forever. Anyway, uh, please like this video if you liked it. Do join us in the comments for all the toroidal discussion. If you're looking forward to the toroidal tutorials, then please click subscribe. Otherwise, you can check out some of my older videos like this silly and very disorienting Avata-style head tracking thing that I did. Still gives me nightmares. Uh, yeah, also, I'm new to this whole thing, but y'all can also buy me a coffee or a tea, more accurately, because I don't actually drink coffee, but buymeatea.com does not exist, so buy me a coffee link down in the description and uh, along with links to absolutely everything related to this Toronto topic. So thanks again. And uh, yeah, I'll hopefully see you guys in the next one. I'm not joking. Little mouse like ran across the floor over there. See what happens when you leave your house for like one month and don't touch it. Just, you know, people move in rent free. <laughs>